All right, family. I, I, it's been a great, great series so far. These last two weeks, man, forget about it. Pastor Dustin Hawkins, shut it down, man. I'm so grateful for him. I'm so grateful for Pastor Tori Montgomery. But today, man, I got a friend of mine who is all the way from Livingstone Church right here in San Antonio, Texas. Pastor Landon Kiker, him and his wife Kelly and, and their three beautiful children, they are they are leading Livingstone Church. And I, I'm just excited what, about what God is doing through him. That he is a voice in the city, a fresh voice in the city. And, and, and I'm believing God that today he's going to speak directly to you. He's going to speak directly to your situation. So wherever you are, all over the building, let's just stand up on our feet. Let's make some God chaser crazy noise for my brother, Pastor Landon. Hey, give it for Jesus. Come on, give him the best praise. Come on, just a little longer. Give him your best. Give him your best. I know your hands are tired, but give him your best. We thank you, Lord. God, would you have your way in our hearts this morning? Would you have your way in our hearts, God? Would everything inside of us from the last week that's been clouding our minds and maybe bringing some confusion or distractions, God, right now, we choose to say yes and amen to you. Whatever you got to say to us today, we say yes and amen to it. Would you put your hands on the person's shoulders next to you? I know we don't normally do this. We don't at our church at least. I don't know how, how friendly y'all are, but I want you to pray. You don't mind not even know their name, but just repeat after me. Lord Jesus, open their heart and mind to receive the word of the Lord today. May it come through clearly and change their life forever. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, give Jesus praise one more time. Well, it's good to be with you guys. I just want to give honor to your pastors. They are incredible people. You guys are led well. You guys are led very, very well. High five somebody saying, glad you're here. You're looking good. Now turn to your second choice and say, you too. You look good too. David, could you bring me my notes right there, buddy, in that painting? Thank you. Well, go ahead and have a seat. It's, I'm so glad to, to, to be here at God Chasers. Thank you, sir. Um, what God is doing in your church is not normal, and I hope you know that. I hope you know that. Normal is boring, and we should never be normal. Um, God did not call his people to be normal people. Uh, what's interesting about this is today we finished our two services this morning, and then I got in the truck, and uh, as soon as we did altar call, I booked it out the side door and got in, I got in the truck and got over here. And on the way over here, uh, it's about a 15-minute drive from where we are. I just I felt like something needed to shift. And and I, your your pastor is a very trusting, loving person, because uh, I told him I felt like something needed to change. And I'd already sent my notes uh, over to Tiffany, I believe, and and they had it all ready and had it looking good. And I, and I'm so sorry you'll never get to see it. No, maybe I'll, uh, I'll preach that one next time. How does that sound? But there's. There's, there's something about if, if God is going to shift something and we're not listening, we, we get in, in trouble. And, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about somebody who got stuck today. And, and you guys were calling this fire power revival, right? I could, the only other words I could add to that would be like ballistic, nuclear. Like you guys picked some big words, Pastor. So I'm going to do everything I can to live up to fire power revival. Uh, John chapter 5 is what I asked them to put on the screens. And I, I don't have a lot, a lot of bullet points for this because here's what I know. I want us to go to the passage and read it. And then we're going to chop it up a little bit. And there are hidden truths in this text I, I've got to dig out for you. And then um, and we'll, see, we'll see where God takes it from there. John chapter 5. After these things, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. 
And now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda. Everybody say Bethesda. Bethesda. Having five porticos. In these lay a multitude of those who were sick, blind, lame, and withered, waiting for the moving of the waters. Now this is this is this next part is where we gotta ask Jesus questions when we get there because it's kind of weird. Because this is one of those things we're going to ask him when we get up there. Why did an angel have to come down and do this? An angel came down and stirred up the water in certain seasons. And whoever got there first got well. Now, we don't understand that completely, but I believe by the end of the day, we're going to have some more clarity there. Verse 5, and a certain man who was there had been there 38 years in his sickness. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, don't miss this part, in that same condition, he said to him, do you wish to get well? The sick man then answered him, said, sir, so he didn't know it was Jesus. He had no clue. He said, sir, I don't have anybody to help me to put me in to the pool when the water stirred up because while I'm coming, somebody beats me there. Verse 8. Jesus said to him, arise, take up your pallet and walk. And immediately the man became well, took up his pallet and began to walk. Fast forward to verse 14. And afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, behold, you've become well. Don't sin anymore so that nothing worse might befall you. The man then went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who have made him well. Somebody say amen to the reading of the word. All right, you may be seated. I want to give you some observations. Let's go back to verse chapter 3. This passage of scripture came to me. Our church is in a thing right now, a season uh, called 21 Days of Prayer. And every day at 6 a.m., people come and pray. And, uh, and it's a an investment. I live in Cibolo. I got drive. You know, it's an investment. It's a two-hour prayer thing for us. You're driving out from where all the cows are, so it's a little bit, a little bit of a drive. But when I get up there and I see these people giving it their all, something shifts, and I know that that God had me at prayer that day, and He gave me this this passage this last Tuesday, and and I. This was not even something I was supposed to bring today, and and I, but I knew something's different. I look at. I look out at you, and I look at what God's doing in our city. Yeah. God, God's, God is taking a city that is familiar with religion and having to shift it to relationship because what we see here is, a, some, is somebody who had a need, and the religious leaders at the time cared not about the need. They weren't even where the sick people were. And they left the hurting people there for 38 years. And that's church as usual. But your church isn't normal. It doesn't do church as usual. Because there's a vision to help people that are hurt and broken and need Jesus. So you didn't come here looking for religion. And, and, and if you came here thinking you were going to find religion, you came to the wrong church. Uh, because that doesn't live here. Your pastor fights to make sure it doesn't. Look at verse 3. Everyone say the word sick. sick. And I'm not talking about the good sense of the word. These guys were straight sick. And they were broken and withered and hurt and beaten. And they were, I mean, have you ever seen, I, I grew up in, in West Texas and my, my dad runs a homeless ministry there and helps rehabilitate people off the streets, gets them back into the workforce. I, that's the kind of church I grew up in. And, uh, and so I grew up with, I mean, I'll go preach there. It's, the, it's some of the people I've known my entire life, and they used to be homeless, and now they're not. You know, now they're, now they're ushers at the church. You know, it's like, that's the kind of church I grew up in. It's amazing to see a guy that can do in a life when it's humbled. Amen. And so I, I see these people who were hurt and broken, and then I've just seen my own father, like, reach down and, and, and grab somebody who who's got methamphetamine sores, open sores all over them, and, and, and they don't even know where they are. And then to see them not only rehabilitate, but their wife comes back and they get remarried. They get their kids back. They own a home. You see God do something. They're sick, broken, withered, hurting. And then Jesus walks by. 
and something begins to change. Verse 3, when it says the word sick, that word in the Greek is astheneo, and it means to be feeble in any sense of the word. So there's, there's a, a feebleness that, that it, it just cripples you. You and I, it might not be a physical feeble. There's, I, I believe that the devil is doing something very special in our country, in, the, in people's minds. And suicide rates have gone up. People are locked in with depression, anxiety. The devil doesn't have to do as much as he used to because we do it to ourselves. We need Jesus now more than we ever have because the battle is in the mind. It, there's the 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 addiction is to the chemical releases that are in your mind with the stress hormones and you need them as bad as you needed the drugs you used to take. It, and it's just not visible. You can even serve God and have that going on and nobody knows. Because you don't smell like anything, you don't look like anything, you look the same, but the devil's got you locked. And when I look at this word sick, uh, when, you, when you go to the derivation of the word, it means without strength, powerless, and impotent. So there's no ability to reproduce anything healthy because you're spiritually impotent and sterile. There's no way you can move forward because you're sick. And I, and I feel like I've got a word for somebody today about verse 4. It talks about certain seasons. Say certain seasons. It says in certain seasons the angel would do this. Now the, when you look at seasons and time, the Bible talks about that in two different ways. There's Kronos and Kairos. Kronos is the chronological. Things just happen in order. It's, you know, that's, that's normal time. But then there's a Kairos moment. There's something different. That means an appointed time from heaven. There's some, that might be today for you. You might, have got, you might have come here today hoping Pastor Dante was preaching and you got me. And you're like, oh, come on. Well, I believe I'm your appointed time for whatever this is. <laughs> Something's important. In John chapter 5, we see somebody who is broken, beaten, sad, sick, rejected on the outskirts of the city by the sheep gate, hidden from everyone who looked the part. And then Jesus decides to take the scenic route to the feast and goes through the pool of Bethesda. That was not where he was supposed to go. But he goes through this place and becomes someone's appointed time. Verse 6, Jesus sees him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time in that condition. See, that means Jesus looks down and it looks like he, that, that guy had set up shop. He probably had hung up pictures in his little part of the pool at Bethesda. It looked like the guy had been there quite a while. And how, how else would Jesus know and look down and say, look like he'd been there in that condition, something was letting Jesus know this guy had been there a while. And then he asks him this question. Do you wish to get well? Do you want to get well? Do you wish to get well? Now, you might be thinking, what a jerk move by Jesus. Why would he do that? Why would Jesus walk into where all these hurting people are and go, well, do you really want to get well? Obviously, Jesus was not being rude. There was something important here that you and I need to learn. And we've got to dig in to the Bible to find out. What I love about what Jesus did here was that he was exposing the, the congregation of the sick. Because you can, I've, I've gone to churches and I've been members, been, I've been a member of churches where you go there and there's a cross on stage, but Jesus hadn't been there in a while. <laughs> And I just wonder, just, I just wonder if Jesus was exposing, it said there would lay a multitude of the sick, birds of a feather, stay sick together and flock together. And so I believe that Jesus was saying, do you wish to get well? Because it looks like to me, like you and, and all your friends here are having a good time staying sick together. Because when you start to get well, the people that you wanted you to stay sick are not going to like that very much. They're going to do everything they can to get you sick again. And some of you know what I'm talking about. And I won't like dig too much into the detail and guess what, how many sick people are in your life. I'm not going to do that. But what I do want to tell you is it's better for you to walk the road to find new people to walk around than to go back to the pool at Bethesda 
and visit your old buddy. But my heart beats for them. They'll have their Jesus moment. You pray for them. You, you, you send them script. Send them every sermon Pastor Dante's ever preached. Send it to them. But that doesn't mean you got to hang out with them and bring them over to your house and let them around your kids. You don't do anything like that. You got to use some wisdom there. Jesus says, do you want to get better? Do you want to get well? And we're looking at this guy. I don't know if he does or not. I don't know if this guy wants to get well. 38 years? You mean to tell me that you couldn't have like moved an inch every year and rolled into the water first? Like, like you, do you really want to get well? Do you really want to help yourself? Do you really want to? If Jesus didn't do that because you and I would have done that. I, I would have walked up to the pool and went, dude, 38 years? I mean, you couldn't have like conned somebody by now to throw you in the water. Something. Like you couldn't have learned the ropes. Like it, there's, there's either, there, there's some kind of obstacle. Jesus knows it. So he goes straight to the heart of the issue. Here's what I love about Jesus. I'm not here to highlight the man and his insecurities and his issues. I'm here to highlight Jesus. Because the Bible says if he be lifted up, he'll draw everyone to him. So I'm here to highlight Jesus. The man did not reach out to Jesus. The man didn't even know Jesus was there. So the man didn't even reach out. Jesus stooped down into his condition and spoke to him. So for those of you that think that Jesus doesn't like being around sick people, for those of us that feel like we have to have everything together yeah, before we can down. approach Jesus, Jesus wasn't even supposed to be there. He was supposed to be at the feast, yeah, yeah. but he, instead he walks around the block, goes the other way, on purpose walks through a place where there's infection and disease rampant through the water, walks through there in his sandals at risk of being infected himself, reaches down into their addiction, their sin, their mess, and their broken marriages and all their issues and all their pain and all their, their problems in the mind and says, do you want to get well? And he's, he's, I just bet he's saying the same thing to you today. Do you really want to get well? Do you want to get well? The kindness of the Lord is why he sees us that way. And he doesn't look at us and go, how dare you do that? Why did you do that? You might say that to your kids, but Jesus doesn't say that to us. Because I got three kids and sometimes I'm like, what were you thinking? I don't, Jesus doesn't say that to us. He goes, do you want to get better? Do you want to get well? He sees you broken and then immediately offers a pathway to the fix. He doesn't highlight the 38 years. He doesn't even bring it up. So anytime you hear about the 38 years, it's not God bringing up the 38 years. It's not him. He says, you were stuck in this condition for 38 years. Do you want to get well? I wonder what mental battle, what repetitive sin struggle, what website you're clicking on what physical illness you have could be fixed by stopping going through McDonald's every day. How many issues in your Bible are highlighting our issues? Because you and I were, were, like, were rebuking the devil, but we can't stop drinking Dr. Pepper. And I wonder how many of your demons are actually you. Am I in trouble, Pastor? Is this a... I saw someone taking their earrings off. I'm about to run. I'm about to run. Y'all don't know me. I'm fast. I'm about to run. Guys, I'm trying to tell you the truth. There are so many times in my life I was upset with God and mad at the devil, but it was me. And then God got a hold of me and said, Landon, do you, do you want to get well? When I finally got sick enough and tired enough, and when I finally found out that the pain of staying the same was greater than the pain of moving forward, you push, you push, you stand up, you walk off, you stand up and you get out, you walk out. And guess what? Sometimes it is embarrassing. But never in my Bible have I read that God will not embarrass you. 
Never in this Bible have I ever read that if you follow me, you'll never be embarrassed. If you follow me, you'll never be persecuted. In fact, it says the opposite. Not only you're going to speak in tongues and everyone's going to think you're drunk, you're, you're going to do things that no one else can do, and they're going to try to talk you out of it, make you think it's the devil. All your friends are going to desert you, and you're going to be embarrassed. But I'm telling you this. When people see the true Jesus in you, see, people get stuck in these sin patterns because they're afraid of looking a certain way. And in an age in our culture where social media has convinced you that you're not good enough. Wow. Wow. When you scroll through Instascam at night and compare yourself. And you're comparing your life to everyone else's highlight reel. You start to feel the pressure. So one of the things is, if you want to get well, for me, Landon, do you want to get well? I didn't have social media on my phone for two years. And you're like, how can you live? Great, actually. <laughs> it was great. It was great. Now the only people I follow are like Ezekiel Elliott and, you know, other people like that. And he's making me mad right now. However, uh, Lord bless the Cowboys. We're trying. We're trying. Jerry Jones. Is, Lord help me. We got, we got to pray for that man. But, it, but there, was, there was a time in my life where I cared more about what everyone else thought than God. And he said, do you want to be well, Landon? And that was one of the things. Sometimes you're, you're asking God for like this this big revelation and he's just asking you to do the simple things first asking you to do the simple things first now i love that my jesus looked down into my condition and found me verse seven i love how the sick man starts to tell jesus something jesus asked him do you want to get well and then he doesn't pray because he didn't know it was jesus so he doesn't pray and then he doesn't even ask jesus for anything He's just stating his problem. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I was taught as, as a kid growing up in, in, in a very loud, boisterous environment. And I mean, I got hit with more flags and worship than, I mean, that, maybe that's what's wrong. I know I got hit with lots of Jehovah banners and tambourines growing up. <laughs> there was oil flying everywhere. I mean, it just, it was, it was fun. <laughs> it was fun. But what I was, one of the things I was taught that I had to unlearn was that when I approached God, I had to approach him as if he was like the president. But in, all I see right here is that God wants me to tell him everything honestly up front. Yeah. And, and he just says, he doesn't, there's no preamble. There's no, there, there, there's, it's just, well, here's what's going on, sir. I don't have anybody to help me. Nobody will help me. And what's interesting about the word he uses, nobody, I have no man to put me in the water. The word put there is the Greek word balo, and it's part of the word where we get the, the word devil. Dia balo, it's a Greek compound word. Dia as in diameter, balo is where we get ballistic missile. So the devil's word, Spanish gets the word diablo. So the word devil literally means he'll come between you and your spouse. He'll come between you and your pastor. He'll come between you and your employer. He'll come between you and your children. He'll come between you and your destiny and blow up. That's his job. So when you start to feel a little bit of separation, the devil's involved somewhere. He's trying to push you apart. He's trying to make sure you don't stand together. Because if you're separated... You won't be able to fight him as well. And he's a coward. That's why he does that. He doesn't fight fair. And so when we see the word balo here, he's this man, this sick man. There's other words in Greek that he could have used that were more chill. He could have used words like, no one would assist me. But he didn't use the Greek word for assist. He used the Greek word for thrust and force and throw and push. He said, I have no one to thrust me. I have no one to chunk me into the water. I have no. He used the highest violent word he could yeah. for his blessing. Yeah. And he was at his wit's end. Now, let me get a little Bible nerd for a second. This was written in a tense and a mood called the aorist subjunctive. And what that means is this person was not saying, I have no one to help me, as in, can you help me find some help? He was saying this as, I have no one to help me. No one will ever help me. I'll always stay this way. I'll never get better. That was his attitude. 
That's the tense and the mood of the scripture. And then he, then I love what Jesus says. Jesus doesn't even acknowledge that, oh, that, I'm so sorry. You have no one to help you. He bypasses all of that and he says, arise, take up your pallet and walk. He goes right to the fix. Because religion says this. So for some of you that thought this church was going to burn down when you walked in. Your sin is more of a big deal to you than it is to God. He's trying to get to your heart. Stop highlighting your sin and magnify Jesus. The closer you get to him, things start to fall off of you. The closer you get to him. Because it can't live with him. But if you just walk closer... Because last time I checked, Jesus catches his fish before he cleans them. He's after you first. He's not trying to clean you first. Get to him first. And here's what I saw in the scripture that just, this is what lit me up Tuesday. Religion tells you, you have something you need to do in order to get to what God has. So you better be exactly in the right frame of mind all the time. Who can live with that pressure? Not me. You better act right all the time. Who can live with that pressure? Not me. I got tired of First Church of Fake. I got tired of it. It wasn't working for me. It wasn't working for me. I'm up here. I was up here leading worship. I started out as a worship leader and I was up there leading worship and songs were bad back then. They're way better now. But I was up there leading worship and the whole time inside... I, I knew I don't believe a word I'm saying. But I need them to think I do. Religion tells us act the part. Act the part. Act the part. Okay, now you're good enough to have a pool. Relationship says, Jesus says, um, I'm in charge of the angel that shows up down here. And I gave him a break today. So what we're going to do is we're going to break through all the religious molds and I'm going to break all the rules and you're going to get healed now. Instead, do you want to get well though? And Jesus heard in that man's voice, the despair and the agony and the hurt and the pain. He wanted to get well, but he was so broken and Jesus knew this man needs an immediate miracle and relationship pulls us to, to, to Jesus. We don't have to. Have everything perfect. You ever heard people say, man, I'll have kids when I get enough money. You ever had? You'll never have kids. <laughs> You'll never. <laughs> Just have the kids. That's a prophetic word for somebody in this room. Your next baby dedication in nine months is going to skyrocket, Pastor. Just Let's just pray right now. Some of y'all some need to go home and pray in tongues. Just take that however you want. Some of y'all need to go home and pray about that. And some of us know that God is up to this. He's up to getting you to your healing, but you got to want it. What do you mean I got to want it? I'm at church, Landon. So was I. So was I. Being in church does not make you a Christian. There's being on stage doesn't make you a leader. Having a title doesn't change anything. I was caught up in appearances. Religion had me bound. And I know that Jesus is saying, I want, I want to show you something, then we'll walk. Let me show you myself, then we'll walk. Not walk and then I'll reveal. He's not teasing you. He's giving you all of himself up front. That's why being in relationship with people is so important. Knowing people at the depth of true friendship is, is important. Now, upon hearing this, you and I are compromised. You are now responsible for the content that which you've received. And, 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 and it's important for you to know that Jesus found him. Verse 14, Jesus found him where? In the temple. Now, temple is just a word for where God is, where God wants to go, where God is welcome. Jesus found him in the temple I believe that where the man went after his miracle is part of the process for me and you. And when I was reading this on Tuesday morning, I was like scribbling as fast as I could, writing some of this stuff down as I was hearing it. Jesus went to him to get him saved. But 
every step after that had to be done by the man himself. So you and I get saved and we're sitting there at the pool of Bethesda and we're like, praise the Lord, but we stay on the map. Can you imagine the infection and the blood and the pus that was everywhere? We stay sitting in all of that mess. Well, man, I'm so glad Jesus healed me. Dude, you're bleeding on me. Like we just, no, I can't, no, get away, get away. We stay in the old environments. We stay on our phones. What I call this is navel gazing. Just looking at me, looking at my issues, looking at my problems. Jesus is standing right there wanting to heal you and you don't even know he's there because you're not looking up. But Jesus said, arise, take up your mat and walk. Now that's gross to me. That mat had to be disgusting. You ever seen somebody with a pillow that they've had since they were kids? I met somebody who did. If that's you, I'll buy you a pillow. You need some help. There's, imagine how heavy that mat was. The day Jesus came, the mat changed from burden to testimony. The day he accepted Jesus. He says, arise, take up your mat and walk. So he's walking by. He's got all these religious people looking at him. Verses 10 through 14 say, hey, you're not allowed to do that on the Sabbath. You're not allowed. All the religious people start getting angry when they see someone healed. They didn't even care he was healed. They care he broke the rules. Jesus was always breaking rules. And he said, arise, take up your mat and walk. What that literally means is receive your Jesus, receive your healing, take up your testimony, and then walk out and tell everybody what it is. Yeah, that's the process of Christianity. Take up your mat and walk. There was a visible change in his body, and there was a story that followed the man. There was something powerful. You got to know your testimony in 60 seconds or less. So everywhere you go, you've got this story you can tell people. You, they've got to know. they got to know. Jesus found him in the temple. So if you're here searching for God, your next steps are to stay in the temple. You've got to come back. You've got to stay in the water. You gotta, if, you, if you get a pinto bean and you dip it in the water and you try to eat it, what's going to happen to your teeth? You're going to break your jaw. You've got to stay in the water. In the water, you're softened, you're changed, you're usable, you're edible, you're able to be used by God. You smell good, you look good, you taste good. There's something different. You have to stay in the environment. I think it's amazing that Jesus did not tell him to go to the temple. He just said, walk, and the man chose to go to the temple. Jesus didn't tell him what to do. He just said, go. And he began to make necessary adjustments and steps in his personal life to be where God was. You and I have no different of, a, of an expectation there. Jesus says in verse 14, look at you now. You're healed. Look at you. Go and sin no more so that nothing worse happens to you. That word there, uh, hamartano, just means swerve from the path. So you and I are thinking sin has like this big hellfire brimstone connotation to it. It will eventually if you don't handle it. But here's what I know is amazing. The swerving from the path is subtle. It's, it means to miss the mark. And not because you as a person are bad or there's something wrong with you. It means you miss the mark because you aimed at the wrong thing. And what we want our church to know and what I want this great church to know is that it's the subtle nudges, the subtle distractions, the, the subtleties of relationships that push you here. It's the, it's the little offenses that get into your heart and create bitterness and division that pull you away and kind of get you out of the covering of, of your spiritual authority. And, and then you get left out there uncovered and, and you're wondering, man, why do I feel so alone? There was a subtle nudge somewhere. The devil never shows up with a neon light saying, hey, I'm the devil. I'm here to jack with you today. Let's see how much hell we can raise. He never does that. What does he do? He shows up in that message. 
that one text, that one conversation, and it grows and grows and grows. It's the swerves. I, I had this rental car one time. It was a, one of those brand new Toyotas, Camry or whatever, and, and it had the swerve assist. It freaked me out. I didn't know it was on. You know, I'm not a TV preacher yet, so we don't have those kind of cars. I don't know, maybe you do, but I, I, my car broke down Thursday. So I'm like, I'm, you know, we're, I'm not driving the swerve assist car. And that thing took over. I was like, what in the world? I was cursing the devil and the car was trying to help me. The car determined that I got over into the shoulder and the car steering wheel turned itself back into the lane. And I took my hands off the wheel. I'm going 80 miles an hour between here and New Mexico. There's nothing out there. And it's fun. The speed limit is 80. I was obeying the law. <laughs> and I just watched this car drive me for 20 minutes. And then I turned it off just to see. So I could live on the edge a little, literally. <laughs> and almost went in the ditch. You know how many people in my life were my swerve assist? people that said, Landon, I know, I know you, you look the part, but something's different in your eyes. Had a friend tell me that. Landon, I know you, you, you're telling me you're fine, but I don't believe you. What that person didn't know is he saved my life that day. What he didn't know was that everything changed for me that day. I brought this painting to show you. This was the painting that I, I saw in my mind when I, when I was coming, uh, when I was invited to come here. This painting was given to me, uh, oh man, I can't remember how long ago now, but it's a painting of Peter under the water, and that's Jesus reaching down into the water. I've never seen a painting from the perspective of Peter. What that person told me was, I don't believe you. I'm under the water going, I'm fine. I don't believe you, Landon. What began to uncover in my life was, all I saw under the water was waves and turmoil and something that I would never beat. Remember what the guy said, I'll never get better. No one's there to help me. I began to tell myself that lie too. Wow. Nobody's there to help me. Even Jesus doesn't know where I am. But you've ever, I don't know if you've ever felt like that. This is how crafty I know the devil is. No one can see me. But here's what I found out. Even though it looks like I can't find a way out, Jesus knows exactly where to reach. Every single time. So it, it does not matter how big you think the sin is or how big you think the problem is. Yeah. The problem is a problem. The sin is sin. It needs to be dealt with. God will handle that. He'll help you with that. But what matters is, is you remember he knows exactly where to look. Yeah. And he's looking down in the water. He can see you. And his hand is down there. When Peter said, Save me, Lord. And he went under. Jesus immediately reached into the water and reached for his hand. But Peter had to grab two. Do you wish to get well? Do you wish to be saved? There's a hand from you that has to grab two. And I remember in my life how alone I felt. And how the devil had began to tell me. And I'll just be very vulnerable with you if that's okay, Pastor. And this is why I was in, I preached in Canada last weekend and they asked me to tell part of this story. And I, and I know God's using it to set people free. But there was a time in my life where I believed that maybe this, it's easy, it's easy for pastors to feel this way. Maybe it's better if they, this church had a different leader. I think every pastor feels like that on Monday. <laughs> There's something different when it's maybe my wife would be my kids would be better off yeah. with a different dad. And my wife's still young. She'd be rich if I was gone. Maybe, maybe this would be better for everybody. 
I was in the middle of the darkest place of my life, contemplating ending my life. Leaving worship, singing praises, planning it. So you don't fool me. You don't fool me. And I, and, and I believe that the devil is after the lives of world-changing, God-chasing people. Just like Jesus came and found that man and reached out and grabbed him. Just like he found Peter, reached out and grabbed him. In the middle of the disease and the infection, in the middle of the wind, in the waves, Jesus reaches down and grabs you. And some of you are thinking you're having to try to do something to get God to love you. And he's saying, I'm right here. And whatever burden and pressure has been put on you by other people, I break that off of you in Jesus' name. Let him reach down and grab you. He's here to heal you and help you. He's not mad at you. And he's not trying to tease you. He's, well, he wants all of you. So are you feeble in any sense? Are you, are you feeble? Are you physically weak? Or maybe you're weak morally. Maybe, there's, maybe you're just not aligned with God's values like that. Maybe the devil's getting in that way. Maybe, maybe you're weak mentally and you're just exhausted. And there's some physiological things to that I can share with you. But you're, you start the day with so much energy in this muscle called your brain. And then at the end of the day, it's gone. And then we make decisions then. That doesn't make any sense. The Bible says, start out your day with me. And see how I use all that energy. There's physiological things that also contribute to our spirituality because God made you body, soul, and spirit on purpose. Maybe your life is lacking volume. The Bible says uh, in, in verse, let me see where it is, in verse 15, then he went away and told them it was Jesus. He didn't say, look at me, look how healed I am. Look what Jesus did. Yeah. Yeah. Healed people are vocal people. When God truly comes and changes you, truly, when God came down into my condition, when somebody walked in and gave me this painting, when my friend called me on the phone and called me out, when all of that changed, when all of that happened, my life forever changed. My swerve assist was on. Somebody saved my life. Something changed. And you know what the devil would have told me before, Pastor Dante? You can't say any of that. You can't tell anybody the truth. Because if people in the seats feel like men and women of God are not themselves almost God, then what do they have to live up to? And I had a pastor tell me one of the most damaging things I've ever heard from a person. He told me, you give the people what they need to see. And I was like, What? And they, I was a Bible school kid, and I was like, well, I don't know anything. Maybe he's smarter. And I began to live my life that way. All that did was create a false person, empty of heaven's values, and the devil found it. I'm here to maybe save somebody's life today. I'm, I'm going to end. My iPad tells me I'm done. Um, I'm going to end with this. You thought you were coming here today to come to a service to make your mama happy or they, your friend kept bugging you or you were looking for the antique mall and you just stayed because you were too embarrassed to leave. <laughs> Welcome to God Chasers Community Church. <laughs> However that, however you ended up here, the word Bethesda means house of mercy, house of grace. Mercy is somebody who has the authority to imprison you chooses not to. Grace is unmerited favor. So what's crazy about this pastor is it has nothing to do with me. 
except for the fact that Jesus made it about me and chose in his kindness to find me. And in his kindness, he reached down and picked me up. And I'm, I'm not, I know God changed my message on the way over here in the truck. And, and I know God told me to bring that painting with me, use a different passage of scripture. And I'm a planner. I don't change things last minute. So my notes up here are just scribbles. And that's unnerving to me. So I hope it was beneficial. But I, but I, I want you guys to know... Living life without telling Jesus the truth will never work. And, and I just I want to pray to end. Jesus asks him, do you wish to get well? And then the man tells him the truth of how he was feeling in that moment. I want to. But I can't get anybody to help me. I'm, I'm so withered. I can't even stand. And I've been trying for years, but every time I try, something knocks me back down. And every time I try to get to the next level, someone knocks me back down. And then Jesus would say to you, arise, which means get a new perspective. If you're going to fly with the eagles, you can't walk with turkeys. You got to to get up. You got to get a better perspective. Arise and see how different this can be. Take up your testimony. What the devil was using to kill you is going to set you and thousands of people free. Take up your mat and then go and then walk. Every head bowed and every eye closed. I want to ask this question today. Maybe my testimony helps you a little bit. There's a new day and age in churches where people are actually telling the truth from platforms. I know your pastor is one of the ones that helps lead the way in that, tells you the honest truth. So maybe a little bit of my story helps you feel comfortable to say a truthful answer to the question of, do you want to get well? Do you want to get well? You know what that is. You know what that feebleness is. You know what that feeling is. You, you know what those desires are. You, you know that you're tired and without strength. You know that. You know where you feel powerless. You know where you're sick in your body. I want to tell you today that the healer, the comforter, the savior is here in this house of mercy in this house of grace so that you may walk get your mat and get a fresh start so if you're if you know the answer is yes i want to be well would you lift your hand you want to be well there's something in your life you know you want to be well from you know that there's some god for every hand raised i pray courage to take that next step courage to move boldly forward courage to go where maybe their family tree has never gone I pray, God, that you would see them through that situation, that they would look at the eyes of Jesus instead of down at the infection, that the sin that has entangled them will no longer ensnare them to make their next step. God, would they run to the temple of God? Would they run to the house of mercy? Would they run to the house of grace? And may they never be the same. Never be the same. And the last question before I step off the stage, who is looking for Jesus who is looking for Jesus you came here today and Jesus met you here you have the option to stay sick or be made whole and that starts with salvation if you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life today is the day to say I need Jesus maybe you received him once as a kid but now you're like I'm coming home my kind, loving, compassionate Jesus is reaching down into my problem. I'm going to take that hand. If that's you, I want you to be bold. I want you to stand to your feet. If that's you and you want Jesus to come and change you forever from the inside out, don't be embarrassed. If you're ready to say yes 
to Jesus. Stand to your feet right now. Sister, I see you. I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud of you. I see you back there, brother. I'm so proud of you. Come on. Praise him. The devil's getting a black eye right now, everybody. He's getting hurt right now. Heaven's having a party right now. Come on. Celebrate him today. We thank you, Lord. Now everybody repeat after me. Lord Jesus, I make you my king. Would you forgive me of my sin? Make me a brand new creation. Your word says that when I'm made new, I'm brand new. I'm not renovated. I'm brand new. So I boldly declare that I am a Christian and that I'll never be the same. Never, never, never. In Jesus' name. Now give God the craziest praise you've given him all day.